11th Congress will now come to order. Uh, I want to welcome Ranking Member Chaffetz and members of the subcommittee, hearing witnesses and all those in attendance. Today's hearing will examine the financial stability of the United States Postal Service. Uh, the cha chair and the ranking member and the subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make an opening statement, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Hearing no objections so ordered, I also want to note that Mr. Turner, uh, not a member of the uh, subcommittee, without objection and through unanimous consent, will be agreed to uh, it will be agreed that he will participate fully in, in the hearing without objection. Uh, Mr. Connolly, you had a point of order? Uh, not a point of order, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure that on the previous uh, vote, although it wasn't a recorded vote, uh, that my statement was entered into the record. That, yeah, you had submitted your record, and, and I made a motion to enter your submission into the record. Uh, and so you Happy to support the previous the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Welcome, Ranking Member Chaffetz and members and staff of the subcommittee and today's witnesses as we hold the first subcommittee hearing of the 111th Congress. I'd like to give a special welcome to the Oversight Committee Chairman, Mr. Towns, uh, who is with us this morning, and, and Ranking Member Mr. Issa for joining us this morning. This hearing on the financial stability of the United States Postal Service is not only timely but critical to the American expectation of affordable six-day mail delivery. The subcommittee will now examine the nationwide economic downturn and technological advancements that have produced declining volumes and revenues for the Postal Service. With the Postal Service facing unprecedented budget shortfalls, the subcommittee will consider a number of options to restore financial stability to the Postal Service. We will also examine ways for the Postal Service to continue to operate without cutting services. On March 20, 20th, 2009, the Postal Service announced new efforts to cut costs. Among these plans are to close six of its 80 district offices, eliminate 15 percent of administrative staff positions across all districts, eliminate more than 1,400 mail processing supervisor and management positions, and offer voluntary retirement option, op, excuse me, offer voluntary early retirement opportunities to nearly 150,000 employees. These recent announcements and new reports of the Postal Service's dire financial condition are of concern to myself, the members of this committee, and the American public. I expect that today's witnesses will offer effective and short and long-term strategies to reduce costs and improve efficiency in order to help ensure financial viability of the Postal Service. In addition, to better understand compensation at the Postal Service, I will question the Board of Governors on executive compensation packages. Thank you, and I look forward to having a very informative hearing this morning. And I, at this point, I will yield to our ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. It, it is critical in this time. Uh, this is the first of our oversight hearings on the Postal Service and our first hearing overall. We are here to, today to review the lifeblood issues involving the United States Postal Service. The United States Postal Service touches everyone. There are, there are hundreds of thousands of employees. The postal, in, the postal industry generates hundreds of billions of dollars as the postal system and personnel process literally hundreds of billions of letters and packages. We all need the postal system to thrive. The task at, at hand is enormous. In 2006, the Congress passed the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act, marked up in this committee as H.R. 22. There's now another H.R. 22 before us, which would change the way the Postal Service prefunds retiree health care. The requirement of that the United States Postal Service prefund the employer's portion of this of its future retirees' health benefits while paying premiums for current retirees is seen as an unnecessary cost burden. One thing is for sure: the United States Postal Service is in serious financial trouble. In January, on January 28, 2009, the Government Accountability Office issued a significant study regarding the deteriorating postal finances requiring aggressive actions to reduce costs. We must continue to do our utmost to ensure that the Postal Service is managed responsibly, effectively, and with the greatest integrity, and that we're constantly looking for savings and other ways to be creative within the Postal Service to provide maximum service to the American people as it's articulated within the United States Constitution and making sure that we are providing a service that will allow our businesses, our friendships, the personal notes that will go uh, through the Postal Service, 
and that that uh, system continues to thrive. With that in mind, we must also inquire into the Postmaster General's compensation package, uh, possible consolidation uh, policies within the, uh, the system itself, and the relocation policy in force and other issues that will become before us. With that, I look forward to the testimony, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate uh, being able to participate today. Thank you. At this point, the Chair would like to recognize uh, the full committee chairman, uh, the gentleman from Brooklyn, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Chairman Lynch. Before starting my opening statement, I would like to congratulate you on becoming chairman of the important subcommittee and thank you for your leadership and insight in holding today's hearing on the Postal Service. I also would like to congratulate the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffet, who as a freshman has already taken on an important leadership role in the House by serving as ranking member of this subcommittee. Congratulations. Today's hearing is fittingly entitled Restoring the Financial Stability of the United States Postal Service. What needs to be done? charged with the awesome task of providing prompt, reliable, and efficient universal mailing service to all communities, businesses, and households throughout the United States in territorial areas. The United States Postal Service has certainly withstood the test of time, but the massive operational and financial challenges confronting the Postal Service are unlike any we have ever seen before. Having ended the last fiscal year with a net loss of nearly $3 billion, and that's B as in boy. The deteriorating economic condition of the United States Postal Service can no longer be ignored or deferred. With electronic communications taking more and more customers out of the lobby of the post office, coupled with the enormous contraction of the United States economy, the Postal Service is struggling to remain a financial sovereign and viable entity for both now as well as in the future. Yet the question remains, how exactly will such stability be regained and more importantly maintained in the new and evolving 21st century economy? As mail volume declined and costs from labor, energy, and expansion in the delivery network continues to increase, the Postal Service, its union affiliates, the Congress, and the country must take some difficult make some difficult decisions to get us through difficult times. And so, Mr. Chairman, it is my hope that today's witnesses will allow us to get at some of those answers and to help us determine what may, what may have already been done to curtail costs, what innovations are currently in the works to reinvent the re and revive the Postal Service, and lastly, what we in Congress may need to do to restore the Postal Services. Uh, financial standings and to ensure the Postal Service's extraordinary reliability and service. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding such a timely hearing, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to have you here with us. The Chair recogni now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for five minutes. The gentleman passes. Uh, Chair recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Chairman Lynch and the ranking member uh, Shaftet for um, allowing me to participate in today's hearing on the financial state of the United States Postal Service. Uh, I look forward to reviewing the testimony from all of today's witnesses. Uh, General Potter, I want to thank you for participating in today's hearing. In the materials we have received in preparation for today's hearing, the Postal Service has increased their long-term debt from $0 in FY 2005 to over $7 billion in FY 2008. I, along with other members of this committee, are concerned by these figures and want to work with the Postal Service to find cost savings in measures that will help maintain the viability of the Post Office in the future. <clears throat> that said, uh, as some of you know, the DHL, which operated their North American operations within my congressional district, recently recently ceased uh, their domestic express shipping business, leaving essentially UPS and Federal Express as private shippers in the U.S. domestic shipping market. I am concerned that this market consolidation will have an impact on costs in domestic shipping uh, and was hoping that uh, during this, uh, this hearing that you could comment on how this development in the private shipping markets could impact the Postal Service's ability to remain competitive. 
Given that the U.S. Postal Service actually contracts with private shippers for some of its delivery services, how might this consolidation in the market affect these contracts, and how might these costs um, result in increases overall to the, to the Postal Service? Again, I look forward uh, to working with you to find effective ways to helping the Postal Service remain competitive, and I'm interested in your, uh, your comments concerning the consolidations in the market. Thank you. Now, the, the chairman neglected to, to note uh, at the beginning of the, the hearing that because we have five panels today in this committee, uh, we will be here very late unless we adhere very strictly to the five-minute rule. So members will have five minutes to, to ask a question and have it answered. Uh, and when the time runs out at the end of the five minutes when that light turns red, uh, whoever is speaking may have the opportunity to complete their thought, but uh, we, we're going to maintain a fairly strict five-minute uh, limit, otherwise we would be here again very, very late. Uh, at this point, uh, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to commend you on your leadership and also thank you for this very timely hearing. Last week, the Postal Service announced that it was closing offices and offering early retirement to nearly 150,000 employees, almost a quarter of its workforce. The agency indicated this action was necessary because of sharply lower mail volumes due to the recession. Supporting and shipping revenues, not taxpayers, the Postal Service is experiencing a short-term financial crisis. I believe that Congress can act to provide some immediate breathing room at no cost to taxpayers by supporting the bill that I've co-sponsored with Representative John McHugh of New York. Our bill, H.R. 22, removes an outdated retiree health benefit mandate designed for much happier times. When we pass the PAYA, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, um, the climate was a bit different then than what it is now. Times have changed. The national economy is in a recession, and there is no place more reflective of that than the economic reality that the Postal Service, which has seen a steep decline in mail volume and revenue since December of 2007. Despite declines in mail volume and revenue, the Postal Service nevertheless is obligated to cover the cost of operating an extensive network of facilities, delivery vehicles, and personnel necessary to serve the nation six days a week. Even with continuing extraordinary steps to cut cost, the enormous fixed cost of operating the National Mail Service threatens to overwhelm the ability of the Postal Service to operate. The aggressive approach to pre-fund and future retiree health benefits that appeared doable two short years ago is now untenable in my estimation. I hope that this hearing will give us an opportunity to thoroughly explore the problems and difficulties being faced by what I consider to be one of our great national treasures, that is, the Postal Service. Actually, this time has been coming for quite some time, and we've been putting off, delaying, deferring, not dealing with, hoping that somehow or another, the inevitable we would not have to face up to. But I think the time has now come. There's unequivocally no doubt in my mind that some serious reevaluation of our postal service must take place. And I believe that that evaluation will begin this morning. So I want to thank you for this hearing and certainly welcome Mr. Potter. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, Chu. I join my colleagues in uh, expressing our appreciation for this hearing. Uh, we hold this hearing today at a time when our national economy uh, is struggling and the United States Postal Service is not immune to that trend. Uh, Postmaster General John Potter, who will testify before us today, recently, recently testified before the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and 
governmental affairs that the Postal Service operated at a $2.8 billion loss for fiscal year 2008. He said the loss can be attributed largely to two factors, the unprecedented decline in mail volume due to increased use of electronic communications and other factors, and the economic recession that is affecting all sectors. Mr. Potter further outlined his plan for action to achieve fiscal solvency. In addition to raising postal rates, the Postal Service has been able to identify over $2 billion in cost reductions ranging from consolidation and modernization of plant operations to cuts in the city delivery options. Many tough decisions have had to be made, not the least of which is a cutback of 15 million work hours in the first two months of this year. In addition to the, in addition to the 50 million work hours saved in 2008 and the 36 million work hours saved in 2007. The Postal Service's 600,000 career employees have had to face serious cutbacks to ensure the agency's vi viability, and we commend them for their sacrifice. Still, this may not be enough. Mr. Potter indicated in his testimony before the Senate panel that the Postal Service may have to reduce delivery service to five days a week rather than the current six-day schedule. The headline-grabbing reality served as a wake-up call to the American public and to those of us in Congress who represent them. The United States Postal Service is currently the most dependable, expansive mail delivery system in the world. Ours is the only system that guarantees timely delivery to every address in the country six days a week without fail. That is why we must do all in our power to ensure that it continues to thrive. Some tough choices will have to be made, including both short-term solutions like that proposed by H.R. 22, which would allow the Postal Service to use its reserves to pay employee health benefits, to more long-term decisions such as cutting back work hours and service delivery. I expect that the leadership of the Postal Service will have to make some sacrifices as well, including Mr. Potter himself. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Our chair now recognizes uh, the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. I, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is perhaps the real moment of truth for the Postal Service and for the Congress of the United States. Um, we have sat uh, with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, before you became chair uh, in hearing after hearing where we noted the decline of the Postal Service through, frankly, no fault of its own, even if it were the most efficient corporation in the United States, um, it could not have uh, been the same Postal Service it was when all of us were children, given competition from private carriers and particularly, and perhaps most importantly, competition from other forms of communication. Um, we are, the, the, the decline in the so-called volume of postal, uh, postal volume now uh, <laughs> during what we're politely calling a, a recession, which has taken down jobs in 50 states, has to be seen at, 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 on top of what the Postal Service was already experiencing. Um, the Postal Service had been driven into many economic efficiency moves. Um, by the factors I have, have named. Today I will be interested in what further can be done in efficiencies. It's very hard to believe that the Postal Service, given what it was already up against, hadn't, uh, hadn't, hadn't exhausted uh, e efficiencies. Um, I do note that the Postal Service is like other large American corporations uh, having to deal with health care. Um, and I also note that health care paid a major, uh, was a major element in the takedown of the American industry that literally created the American middle class, the automobile industry. Uh, and I, I think that somehow or the other, everybody has to, to look at that when it comes to this uh, particular corporation. There's no question in my mind it could take it down. 
uh, <laughs> the question becomes, what do we do to keep that uh, from happening? There may be some temporary things we can do. We have to watch out what we we do. Something's got to give. I don't blame the postmaster for talking about five day a week uh, a service. I know he doesn't want to do more layoffs. Uh, but if something's got to give, we've got to find out what it is if we want to remain a country that has a national postal service. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm delighted to be here uh, today. And welcome, Mr. Potter. Uh, just uh, want to note that uh, uh, obviously the uh, postal service uh, uh, is struggling uh, in this economy like everybody else and is struggling to try to uh, make itself a more solvent organization. I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of H.R. 22, which have enacted, we believe, would save as much as $2 billion in retirement payments this year for the Postal Service. I do want to stress, however, Mr. Chairman, that just as we uh, have seen a concern about issues like bonuses in non-performing companies or companies that can't meet their, uh, their uh, financial uh, goals, uh, I think the Postal Service has to look to itself uh, in that regard as well, and I would hope this hearing would examine that. I also, as somebody who until nine weeks ago was the head of a, local, a very large local government, I think about my own jurisdiction, uh, the Merrifield Post Office, which serves all of Northern Virginia or most of Northern Virginia. Uh, ours got uh, changed with almost no communication to local governments. Uh, and so I, I would hope that as we uh, explore in this hearing the operations of the Postal Service, we can also talk about improving communication uh, with our local officials so that if there are changes contemplated, there's an advanced notification and the opportunity for some kind of dialogue uh, before those changes are effectuated and having to be absorbed and explained by local officials who had nothing to do with those changes. So I look forward to uh, to this hearing, Mr. Chairman. I may be in and out because we're marking up the budget committee today, uh, the budget today and the budget committee. Uh, but I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hosting this hearing. Oh, thank you. Uh, Chair, now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Baloney, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. I, I just uh, want to welcome the Postmaster General and, and express my uh, support for the Postal Service in H.R. 22. Uh, likewise, I'm in a markup in a, another committee meeting, but uh, to note their bravery through the anthrax attacks and uh, their efforts to get uh, the job done uh, in rural areas and all across our country, and, uh, and my support for uh, working with you in this hearing and, and for uh, more solutions to make the uh, Postal Service more efficient and, and, and to be supportive of the uh, workers and their, their important contribution to our country. Thank you. Thank you. The committee will now hear uh, testimony from today's <coughs> witnesses. Uh, it is the committee policy that all, witness, all, all witnesses are sworn in. I invite uh, Mr. Potter to please ri uh, rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record show that the witness has responded in the affirmative. <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. Potter. Uh, Mr. John E. Potter, Postmaster General and CEO of the United States Postal Service, uh, was named 72nd Postmaster General of the United States of America on June 1st, 2001. He currently sits on the Postal Service Board of Governors and is Vice Chairman of the International Post Corporation, an association of 23 national posts in Europe, North Africa, no, excuse me, North America and the Asia Pacific. Uh, welcome, Mr. Potter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and good morning, uh, Congressman Chaffetz and members of the committee. It's an honor to be here representing the hardworking men and women of the United States Postal Service to discuss the financial challenges facing our great institution. We're working hard to serve America and we're proud of our accomplishments. For example, in 2008, service and customer satisfaction reached record levels. Employee satisfaction hit an all-time high as workplace accidents were at an all-time low. For the fifth straight year, the Postal Service was rated the most trusted federal agency and one of the ten most trusted organizations in America. We reduced our cost by over $2 billion. Let me assure you that we're concerned about the future and we're investing in the future. We're modernizing our website, adding new automated equipment, introducing next generation barcodes to improve efficiency, and we're using the pricing flexibility from the Postal Act of 2006 to grow mail volume. 
But despite these positive efforts, a diversion of mail to electronic communications and the severe contraction of the economy have left the Postal Service in a very precarious position. Over the years, first class mail volume has declined due to the diversion to the Internet. This has been somewhat offset by growth in advertising and other mail. However, ad mail produces less revenue per piece than first class mail. This combined with a growing number of delivery addresses has caused our entire organization to focus on productivity to close the revenue gap. We've taken billions in dollars of costs out of our base uh, and we've done that for the past eight years. None of us, though, anticipated the dramatic downturn in the economy. By the end of this fiscal year, mail volume is projected to fall by more than 30 billion pieces from 2007 levels, the equivalent of $12 billion in lost revenue. Our people have responded heroically. We're working together with our unions and management associations. We plan to reduce costs by $5.9 billion this year alone. To make this happen, we've instituted a nationwide hiring freeze. We're consolidating operations, using fewer machines on fewer work shifts in fewer facilities with fewer uh, mail carriers. We're eliminating thousands of administrative and supervisory positions, and we're offering voluntary early retirement to 150,000 employees. And despite these press unprecedented efforts, and based on current volume projections, we'll come up approximately $6 billion short of breaking even this year. Even with a cash carryover of $1.4 billion and an ability to borrow $3 billion from the Treasury, we will still run out of cash with approximately $1.6 billion in obligations that we cannot meet this year. And I know that the House cares very much about the Postal Service. That's why I'm urgently requesting that, that you enact H.R. 22, introduced by Representatives John McHugh and Danny Davis of this subcommittee, and co-sponsored by over 200 members of Congress. H.R. 22 would permit the Postal Service to pay its share of health benefit costs for current retirees from our Retiree Health Benefit Trust Fund, which uh, today has a balance of $32 billion. The Postal Service contributes more than $5 billion to that fund each year. H.R. 22 addresses our critical cash flow. But we also need to be prudent and look ahead. Mail has helped build this great nation, but with the decline in mail volume, uh, even with the decline in mail volume, we remain a conduit for a trillion dollars in commerce. And a strong Postal Service will, you know, we cannot put a Postal Service at risk. But our law limits our ability to act and adjust to changes in mail use when it comes to pricing, delivery frequency, the number of post offices, and the type of products that we can offer. These restrictions will put our post at risk if we don't step up and change them. The time for change is now. That's why I'm urging, uh, engaging all our stakeholders, consumers, mailers, industry and employee groups, the Congress, the PRC, and others, in a dialogue about how we can keep the Postal Service strong. It will require structural changes to match our service levels with the changing demand. The demand for mail delivery reached a peak of 5.9 pieces of mail delivered to each address in 2000. Today, we're delivering 4.7 pieces of mail. Given this trend, I believe the Postal Service Board of Governors needs the flexibility to change delivery frequency from six to five days. This would help us reconfigure our operation in line with today's demand, keeping rates affordable. We cannot lose sight of the fact that our customers pay the costs of our services. We are not funded by congressional appropriations. We have to find the right balance between service and affordability, and we have to do all we can to avoid having the burden of long-term retiree costs fall on taxpayers. By taking the necessary actions today, I believe we can accomplish both. There is a path to success. I remain bullish on the mail. I'm convinced that mail volume will grow as the economy grows. The mail is important to America. I'm convinced it's a, it's a key to helping the economy grow. A viable postal service requires change. We are pushing the boundaries of change within the postal service, and with your support, we can modify the law to assure a strong and bright future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Potter. Uh, let me begin the questioning. Uh, before, before I do, uh, we have invited uh, members to submit their questions in writing for those who are unable to attend. And uh, I'd like to enter into the record the questions for the record on behalf of Representative Jose Serrano uh, before this committee. And, I, and with unanimous consent, I'll, I'll enter those into the record. Mr. Potter, uh, let me get right to 
one, one issue that is probably uh, uncomfortable for you and, and for myself as well, and that is the matter of your salary uh, and, and, and compensation. Let me broaden that out. There have been some uh, reports in the press that when you dig into the facts and not necessarily reflective of, of an accurate assessment of, of your compensation, but uh, we in our districts, uh, myself with uh, a heavy postal population in my district, uh, I've been confronted with this, well, I'll tell you exactly, uh, I was at the stop and shop the other night and an older gentleman, a retiree of the post office, uh, confronted me as, as my constituents are sometimes want to do uh, and said, let me get this straight, uh, Congressman, you paid, uh, you paid CEO Potter uh, $800,000 to lose $3 billion uh, last year. Uh, couldn't we get somebody to do that job for less? That was basically how they laid it on me. I, I try to explain uh, our position and yours, but uh, I want to give you a, a full opportunity to do that. Given, given today's environment, and I'm sure you're aware of the whole situation with AIG and bonuses and going to Merrill Lynch, in this environment, in these difficult financial times, uh, can we justify, can the Postal Service justify your compensation package, which I'd like you to clarify. I'm sure, I'm sure it's been exaggerated. I've already looked at the numbers here, but I want you, you to uh, basically tell us what your what your compensation uh, package represents, and uh, and how it's broken down. I want you to inform the committee at least your side of the story. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, first, uh, let me talk about elements of this $800,000 plus dollar number. Uh, the first element that uh, I believe probably shouldn't be there in terms of compensation is the fact that I have a security detail uh, which uh, is attributed as a uh, revenue to me or, or paid to me of some $66,000. Uh, that's That service was performed by the United States Postal Inspection Service. So that's an element of my pay. Uh, the, the, my base pay, as prescribed by law, is up to 120 percent of the vice president's salary. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to the Postal and, uh, Accountability and Enhancement Act, it was much less. It was, you know, the equivalent of a, Postmaster General, can you, is there a historic reason why your pay was tied to the vice president of the United States? I, I don't see any similarity in, in, in responsibilities, not to, not to reflect poorly on either one of you, but... Uh, no, I, I, I'm just describing what it is. And I, I the, the rationale was, was the Congress is not mine. I see. Okay. I, I was not imploring people for a pay raise. Uh, the Board of Governors had asked the, the uh, Congress and for additional flexibility uh, to uh, hire and retain uh, talent in the Postal Service. So again, by law, my pay is 263000 Five hundred seventy-five dollars. Uh, since, and as a result of me being a career employee, uh, at my age, every year that I stay, uh, I get two percent additional uh, credit in the civil service retirement system. How how long have you been in that system? I've been in that system since 1978, so almost 31 years. Okay. And so each year that I stay, I get an extra two percent in my pay. In addition to that, since I'm not 55 yet, every year I stay this 2% of a penalty that would uh, accrue if I were to, uh, to leave early. And so automatically every year I stay, there's a 4% growth in terms of my, my pension. And the other thing that drives the pension is a three-year high for employees. They take an average of your, your top three years' pay. And since I got such a steep increase in pay as a result of the law, uh, it produces, in terms of, of uh, pension over the course of my life, uh, me, a value of some 300, 300 okay. plus thousand dollars. I only have about 30 seconds left, okay. and I've got to hold myself to the same rule. Okay. The bonus. I have a, you have a statute that I reviewed that says your pay is basically equal to, your, your salary is equal to the, the vice president's 263000 or something like that. And then I see you get 130 something thousand in a bonus and and quite frankly last year they lost you know the post office lost three billion dollars 
Well, that, that was an incentive payment. It was tied to goals agreed to between myself and the Board of Governors. Uh, the things that drove the, the incentive pay were service performance was a major element, and, and obviously we set record levels. Uh, employee satisfaction, accidents were at record, accidents at record low, employee satisfaction at record high, customer satisfaction at record levels. And I think there was a recognition by the Board of Governors that I wasn't in control of the economy and that we did eliminate 50 million work hours. All right, I'm, I'm going to hold myself to the same rule and I'm going to yield and, uh, and recognize uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes for questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Potter, for being here. My, my uh, congratulations and hats off for, to the entire uh, postal community for the great savings and efficiency that were accomplished uh, under your watch and, under, and with the great work with literally uh, thousands and thousands of others. So congratulations for that. It, obviously, this committee is oversight and government reform, and while we need to talk about some of the huge, massive changes that need to happen in order to put the Postal Service back into the black, I do feel compelled to ask you uh, about a report that was brought to my attention uh, just a very short time ago. Uh, I need to ask you about this. Uh, on March 19, 2009, there was a, a report done by the Republican uh, Committee here that said, uh, Friends of Angelo is the name of this report, Friends of Angelo. Uh, countrywide systemic and successful effort to buy influence and block reform. On page 38, uh, paragraph 3, it says, Fees were also waived for Postmaster General John Potter. Potter benefited from an encounter with Mozilla in 2003. Potter was in the process of arranging a, quote, complicated, unquote, bridge loan when he, quote, coincidentally, end quote, ran into Mozilla. Mozilla instructed Countrywide's Kay Gerfin to, quote, let Potter know that we slash CW, which I take it to be Countrywide, will take care of it, end quote. Mozilla instructed Perry to, quote, take one point off, end quote, Potter's rate and to charge, quote, no extra fees, end quote. Potter was referred to Mozilla and or the v VIP program by former Fannie Mae Chief Executive Jim Johnson. In an email that was issued, uh, it was written in May 21st, 2003, uh, sent by Kay Gerfin of Countrywide. Let me read that. It says, coincidentally, Angelo just ran into Mr. Jack Potter, uh, parentheses, Postmaster General, and, and parentheses, and Mr. Potter will be calling on Friday. Angelo wanted to make sure you were given a heads up to, quote, let Mr. Potter know we slash CW will take care of it, end quote. Also, per Angelo, quote, Take one point off and no extra fees. Deal a little complicated. Bridge loan, dot, 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 end quote. Please let Angelo know as soon as you hear from Mr. Potter. Thank you. In light of this, I, I need to ask if you, if you knew about this, did you t accept the loan, and do you feel like you were given favor by Countrywide through this encounter? Well, first, I do have a loan from Countrywide. Uh, I believe that the, uh, the terms of my loan were uh, the result of a good credit history and the, my financial position uh, and the fact that I was buying and purchasing a home and putting over half of uh, the money down in cash. And, uh, you know, the discussions were strictly between myself and the uh, country where we're all about the loan. There was no linkage to any expectations of uh, official acts or, you know, anything to do with a relationship. Uh, with, with any elected officials that has been, uh, you know. My, my understanding is the Inspector General has, has started an investigation. Are you willing to cooperate with the investigation as completely as possible by turning over all documents, uh, consent to an interview or deposition with the Investigator General, investigators, and are you willing to make other people or help and assist with other people with knowledge of the terms alone available for the Inspector General's office? Yes. How, uh, how much did you save by taking a discounted loan? Again, I think the terms of my loan was uh, consistent with uh, my credit history. How were you, what was, what was the nature of you actually coming in contact? In fact, you were referred to Countrywide's VIP program by former Fannie Mae CEO Jim Johnson's, correct? How did that come about? Well, at the time, Jim Johnson was the uh, co-chair of the Presidents of Commission on the United States Postal Service. So Jim Johnson was working with us as chairman of 
that committee during that period of time. And did Johnson indicate to you that you should expect preferential treatment discounts from Countrywide? No, Johnson indicated to me that uh, because I had, he and I had a discussion, he had overheard me having a discussion with somebody and he basically came up to me and said, oh, congratulations, you're buying a house. I had told him that at the time of the discussion that I hadn't closed yet, that I had made an offer. And he told me that uh, we had a long discussion about how long I was going to work as Postmaster General, how long I anticipated being in the home. He suggested to me that uh, I consider a 723 loan. He also suggested to me that uh, I consider using Countrywide, which is a, a group that uh, provided him with a loan. And you'll complete, you, you'll uh, cooperate fully then with the Inspector General's investigation? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chair now recognizes a gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, while I appreciate your purchase in a new house, um, <laughs> let me try to get down to the post office and, and what we might be able to do about it. We know that we've got serious problems, and we've gone over and over those. I appreciate the cost-cutting approaches that you have developed within the system. I appreciate the proposals that have been made. I appreciate the approaches to streamlining the operations. Of course, I still get people who complain that they don't get what they would hope that they could get which leads me to the point of recognizing that whatever it is that we get, we've got to pay for it one way or another. I'm reminded of Frederick Douglass who said he knew one thing if he didn't know anything else. And that is that in this world, we may not get everything that we pay for, but we most certainly will pay for everything that we get. I'm trying to, we've, some of us believe that H.R. 22 is one way of effectuating some short-term fix for some of the problems that currently exist. Let's say if we, for some reason, were not uh, successful in passing this legislation, within the next two years, what would you predict the Postal Service would, would be forced into or would have to do to try and make ends meet? Congressman, that's a very difficult question. The key for us right now is volume. And I believe that we have to pull out all the stops when it comes to growing volume. I think that uh, we have lost, for example, 20 percent of our advertising mail in, in each of the last two months. I believe that that's going to come back because if you look at advertising in general, it's down. Uh, so uh, what we need to do is we need to get past this downturn in the economy. We need to understand how much of mail volume will come back. There's no doubt that some of the mail lost will not come back. We'll have to step up our efforts to save money. We plan to save $5.9 billion this year. We plan and have a plan to save another almost $4 billion next year. And the reason that we can't do it all at once is because of, of the fact that it does take time to make adjustments in staffing. Uh, I do think that we face the most critical thing we face this year is we're going to run out of money. and so. You know, we're going to have to decide what, which bill not to pay. I intend to pay the salaries of our employees. We may have to forego paying the Treasury, you know, part of what we owe for Retiree Health Benefit Trust Fund. We would, you know, then be faced with, again, the thing that we've put on the table is the notion that we can only cost cut but so much. We have to get at some point at the structural aspects of our business. The reason we talk about moving from six-day to five-day delivery is because our costs 
are there's a variability in costs that we can manage. Fixed costs we cannot. So this year, all, we have volume that's down some 12 percent year to date. We have taken out 15 percent in our mail processing costs because of the variability in that operation. We've taken out 12 percent in our, our post office costs to match the, the decline in volume. But we cannot and have not been able to take it out of delivery costs because if you have the cost of going to every door every day, it's, it's in a sense fixed. The only variable is how much time the carrier spends casing mail. And so that's the dilemma. And that's why we proposed and think we need to explore how do you take and make structural changes that will have minimal impact on the American public and the users of the mail, but at the same time enable us to lower our costs. Let me I, just say that I appreciate your optimism relative to the ability to grow volume. I just don't see how you're going to be able to do it. As a matter of fact, we are increasing the use of electronic communication as opposed to decreasing it. I wish you well. But well, if I, I could, okay. I'm sorry, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, let me first ask a, a quick question on the, the uh, separate from the structural problems, isn't it as far as the deficit that you're running in the relationship to income and so on, isn't it always been true in the post office that the money is made right after a postal rate increase and you show profits and then towards the point where you're going to do a next postal rate increase, you tend to show losses. Isn't that the historic pattern? That was the historic pattern. It was addressed in the Postal Act of 2006. And it, what we went, the change that was made was we went to annual price increases, smaller annual price increases versus we were on a three-year cycle of very large increases. And so the law addressed that. A lot of customers were very concerned about what you just described, the fact that we had these peaks and valleys and there was major impact on the use of the mail in a year when we had double-digit price increases. So you're saying that the loss that you currently have is predominantly uh, somewhat structural, but also very the reason it's more severe because you couldn't annually adjust because business dropped so fast? Well, exactly. And if you think about us as a service institution uh, versus manufacturing, and manufacturing when demand goes down, what you end up with is a lot more inventory. You know, uh, a lot of cars in, in lots that were produced at, at the same productivity. In the service sector, you can't adjust service because the demand changes on, on any given day. And so we've been trying to chase the decline in demand and adjust service to those lower levels of demand. And, and so it created a gap. It's a productivity gap. And we're constantly trying to bring that in line because where we have not been able to do it, as I just I, said, is delivery. I just wanted to make sure that the record understands that the correlation between income and loss is not exactly the same as it is in the financial institutions or in others because of what you just described, which is somewhat of a change from the rate. But there are, there's a structural problem that Mr. Davis just referred to, and that is, is that the whole changing way people communicate and, and so on. And I have uh, two specific things I want to quickly uh, uh, run, run by you. One, probably the most, uh, other than uh, limiting a day of delivery, the closing smaller post offices, it seems to me, I mean, which is also a jobs question, but a, uh, a window access, but also a prestige question coming from a small town myself. It seems to me in the age of computer technology, uh, as we look at the centers like in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I'm from, that uh, have very automated, that we ought to be able to program to keep people's identity. Small towns are losing their schools, they're losing everything else, and this is just unbelievably political pressure, at least for the identity of smaller communities who get absorbed. And I just would like your comment on that. And the second question uh, is that uh, 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 as we watch daily newspapers collapse uh, at an amazing rate right now, um, and as a former retailer myself, and if you pull Saturday delivery and we lose daily newspapers, uh, for example, R. Donnelly has a huge facility in my district. How do they get things to people in a timely fashion when weekends are the biggest sales period? That uh, it seems to me that as you structurally look at this, somehow uh, 
merging some delivery systems, communication systems. I mean, does that mean do you have to deliver in the morning rather than later in the day? Do newspapers have to adjust from a Sunday to a Saturday? Uh, that habits are nice and patterns are nice, but the technology is changing so much we could watch you getting hammered and, and restricted tremendously at the same time newspapers are going out. And how do we communicate and keep our uh, structure moving is how we move goods in the United States. Well, first let me address the question of community identity. Uh, our systems, uh, you know, our zip code based systems are strictly geography based. It's usually a five digit zip code, geography based. Uh, but we have changed our systems to allow numerous uh, names for cities, towns, or geography within zip codes. So there is flexibility within our system to allow that. It's more rigid when it comes to zip codes because of we don't have an infinite amount of zip codes, and so we have to be careful when it comes to that. So seven digit won't wouldn't allow you to expand that. Well, we, we're. I mean, I, there, there is the there, there is the discussion. Uh, the, 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 it's we have simple. right now we have nine digit zip nine, codes and and we could Five literally we could literally you know carve pieces of that out and as a result of that we've enabled communities to to use their community name as an alternate to uh, what might be the name of the formal town and so we allow multiple names within a geographic area uh, but there are segments of the country where we are out of zip codes. Now, regarding uh, delivery, as I, I said earlier, we're reaching out to everybody, all the stakeholders. It's not a fact that we would eliminate Saturday, but we do need to have flexibility there. Sorry, Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Let's see. The gentleman, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Potter, uh, we recognize that there were certain delivery routes, such as those in more rural areas. Uh, we realize those apparently had to be contracted out. But we're concerned with the more widespread imp implementation of that practice. Has the Postal Service expanded its contracting out of letter carriers? And if so, can you prove that it uh, has resulted in cost savings? Congressman, we can prove that contracting out of delivery is less expensive than, than using uh, postal employees. Um, we do have and have stopped contracting out delivery in city areas and in most rural areas. Uh, the reason is not because it's less expensive, but because of this downturn in the economy and the lack of volume. Bottom line is right now we're in a position where we have too many folks. And so, uh, so we in other words, you had too many folks uh, that you were contracting out to? Is that no, we have saying? too many postal employees. So as, as new to, today, we still have, despite the fact that we have a downturn in the economy, we have a growth of about a million addresses a year, over a million addresses a year. Those new addresses are largely being uh, p p delivered to by career employees. And we have an excess number of employees. Uh, gotcha. that we're downsizing. So it would make no sense in this time to begin contracting out or expand contracting out. Talk, talk to me uh, about this whole uh, doing away of, you know, we've talked about this before, this doing away with delivery on Saturday. I mean, is that is that something that's uh, real? I mean, I've heard it before. And then it seems like everybody gets upset and then next thing you don't hear about it for a while. Talk to me about that, uh, and and I know you before the Senate, you again uh, advocated for that change. Um, and to be frank with you, and you know this, the public wants Saturday delivery, and what can we do to maintain it? First of all, let me assure you that being a career employee and coming from a postal family. I did not make that, you know, request lightly. I took it very seriously. I'm very concerned about the future health of the Postal Service. Uh, I, I, we're working very hard with our unions and management associations to try and streamline our operations. The, the real key here going forward is do we have enough source of revenue to support the posts? And we're looking at all options. Uh, when We've been looking around the world to see how are they doing it. Some places 
Posts are banks, and that's how posts are earning money to help pay for uh, you know, the services that are provided in terms of, of hard copy delivery. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm, but we're precluded by law from exploring uh, other uh, forms of revenue. So I think if we put everything on the table, uh, you know, everything there is, including product, uh, you know, choices, uh, how we run our plants, uh, that we might find a way to get there. But the key, the overall key is that there's a decline in mail volume. If that continues, whether it's next year or five years from now, we are going to have to face that, the, the need to structurally change something. And the most obvious place, uh, unfortunately, is in delivery. Mm -hmm. What have you done to try to increase revenue? Anything? Oh, well, we have a uh, number of things. One is uh, we've offered rates that, and we've opened up our system to others to use our uh, system for delivery. So our biggest, believe it or not, package customers are UPS and FedEx. Uh, basically, we'll, we'll, we'll give them access to our system. We have uh, click and ship where people can get online at home, pay for postage, print out a label, put it on the package, we pick it up. We're offering pickup service now. FedEx is, where, I mean, UPS, we have an experiment to do that. Uh, in the ad category, ad mail area, we're offering and working with customers to, to come up with new pricing schemes to incent volume growth. Uh, bottom line is we're making our products much more effective than they have been. We're adding a barcode uh, to, uh, like we're introducing a new barcode on mail. All right, let me ask you this last question because I sure. want to obey the chairman's uh, orders. The a, this HR 22, I mean, what is that the, you consider that to be a solution? Is that a long-term solution? Is it, and what do you like so much about it? It's a short-term solution. Yeah. What I like about it. HR 22. It, HR 22 is a short-term solution for us. It doesn't, you know, won't overcome the longer-term issue that I just described. I like the fact that it's an eight-year bill and that we can plan for eight years what our, our costs are going to be for retiree health benefits. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Potter, um, the GAO, and I'm going to read to you what it said, uh, noted that you had made, uh, you and the Postal Service had made unprecedented cost covering, cost cuts over the years. But then it went on to say, given the growing gap between revenues and expenses, the, UP, the USPS's business model and its ability to remain, to remain self-financing may be in jeopardy. I want to ask you now rather than later, because this creeping problem could creep the Postal Service out of existence. Do you believe that the Postal Service should totally rethink its business model? Have you given any thought to that in the form it would take? And do you believe the Postal Service can sustain itself as a self-financing entity uh, as the 1970 statute uh, made the service? Congresswoman, I believe that we can do that, that we can be a self-sustaining organization for a long time to come. On the present business model? Not on the present business model. I believe that we are going to have to make changes, uh, whether that's the frequency of delivery, whether that's the type of products that we, we can offer. Uh, I think that everything has to be on the table, including uh, the mix of our workforce. Uh, it, we are not in a position today looking forward where we can sit still. The sooner we act, the better off we'll be, and the more viable we will be. The one thing that the biggest trap I think we have is that we don't act quickly enough and we create a, a, well, a the, financial but, but, burden. If I, may, if I may ask, Mr. Potter, that's my problem about quick, quickly enough. So you've suggested we may have to go from six days to five days. This sounds like an incremental approach rather than a business model approach. If one looked at the entire business model, it might, it might be that you came out not with, for example, going from six to five days. Who knows? But if everything's on the table, my question is, is it on the table? Who is doing the rethinking of the business model? When can this subcommittee expect to get some evidence of thinking on a new business model? Uh, well, I, 
I, if, if that's an invitation, we'll, we'll gladly fill if it. If not you, if not you, uh, you surely wouldn't want people who are not ensconced in the business of the Postal Service like ourselves to be the first to come forward and take a hack at it. And I, I, I use I the word hack very uh, advisedly. Uh, because the moment anything gets cut, every member of Congress, including those who most don't want uh, to spend money on anything, will say, uh, you sure can't do that in my community. But I looked at your press conference. I, I, I asked you about six to five days because, again, that seems to me to be more of the same. And thinking it through in that way seems to me uh, dismembers parts of the body piece by piece rather than looking at the body and its core and seeing what can be left standing. Uh, in your in in your in your uh, press release of March 20th, you talk about uh, aggressive steps to cut costs. Uh, you talked about offering another round of early retirement, and then you you spoke about positions um, that you expect to save uh, uh, funds from. Now, staff positions at the district level nationwide. 1,400 pro processing supervisor and management positions. Are these positions, are these layoffs, uh, will layoffs occur? Have they occurred? There will be a reduction in force according to uh, OPM So there will rules. be layoffs? They will. At, at the end, there could be. But we hope to be able to offer everyone a job. And let me ask you about early retirement. Have, have postal um, employees been um, quick to take early retirement when they see the condition of the Postal Service? We've had, uh, I believe, some 9,000 people take advantage of the early How many were offered or expected to take early retirement? Uh, that was a little bit above what, ex what was expected. Uh, it was well over 100,000 people who were offered. Uh, it, it, does, it, it does seem to me, the, the if, if one is talking about big reductions that could come, given the business model, uh, let me just ask you, is there an, another round of early retirement that might be offered? If so, what kind of cost does that entail relative to keeping these people uh, on board? We've just opened up uh, voluntary early retirement to uh, all postal employees through the end of this year. And so when people are being told that their positions are eliminated, they have an opportunity to either seek a different position and or they have the option of retiring if they're eligible. I think that's a very important thing you're doing that way. I do, do think people know how to take care of themselves, and they can see the business model just like we can, and they know that you've been trying. If it's not done one way, uh, it may do another way that really hurts the Postal Service. Got to keep as many people employed as, 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 as we must have in order to deliver uh, the mail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for conducting uh, this hearing. Uh, Mr. Potter, thank you for being here today. You know, I, I understand that you're looking at a, a huge deficit uh, within the Postal Service in the coming years, and I, I understand the proposal to reduce uh, service from six days to five. Um, what would be the savings to go from six days to five days? How much would that save? $3.5 billion. Annually? Annually. 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 Is that right? Okay. Um, how, is, uh, how have your, um, you, in, in, in industries like the auto industry, um, labor and management have found uh, a newfound friendship or relationship. How is that relationship uh, with management and labor in the postal service? Is it, uh, does everybody, uh, has everyone come to the table and said, okay, we know we're gonna have to do some belt tightening. Is that pretty uh, healthy relationship? Well, we've, I've always had a healthy relationship with our unions and management associations, and we've been meeting on a regular basis now that we face this crisis. And everything is being discussed. It's on the table. Uh, we've made a number of changes. Uh, probably the uh, most prominent example is in delivery. We uh, work with the NALC to expedite uh, changes in routes with the rural carriers. We have a count that's going on right now. Um, we have talked at our last meeting, which was uh, – uh, well, it was last Friday, we had a discussion and we're talking about uh, working 
enabling people to move from job to job more easily because we have some pockets of need and some places we're overstaffed. So we're working through to try and uh, get at both efficiency as well as making sure we're accommodating employees. And so uh, the labor community understands what the uh, Postal Service is confronting with and they Without a doubt. work with you. Without a doubt. Wonderful. Are there any advances in uh, technology on the horizon for the uh, Postal Service to help reduce costs, and are there any new ideas to grow the business? We're deploying, as we speak, the, the next generation of flat sorting equipment, which will enable us to put mail into walk sequence, flat mail, catalogs, magazines, and oversized envelopes into walk sequence for delivery. That will make that operation much more efficient. Um, we are also introducing a, a new next generation of barcode, which will enable us to actually count mail as it's sorted as opposed to accepting it. And again, it will it'll eliminate some steps and uh, make the mail more uh, efficient for us to handle. And it will be more transparent to customers, so they'll have a window into how we're processing the mail. So there are a lot of innovations in terms of, you know, that are on the table that are being implemented to uh, get the Postal Service into the 21st century. Let me, let me hear what you, what your, if, if you could, or your wish list for a long-term fix to the retiree health benefit. What would that be, or are you what? will to give that? Well, if it was my wish list, I, I, would, I would like to just revisit this whole notion of the pace at which we pay into the retiree health benefit trust fund. There's no other organization I'm aware of in America that has the requirement that we have. Uh, if we were under GAP pr principles, we would not be paying into this trust fund. I understand the need to do it, but at a time when we're financially strapped, if this was the private sector, we would not make that contribution this year. We would pass on it. Uh, the payments that we're making into that fund are not tied into an actuarial kind of analysis. It was really a... a uh, a holdover from payments that we were making into the Civil Service Retirement Fund. So I would much prefer, I'd love H.R. 22 and I want it to pass, but if you had to step back, I think we, we should re rethink the way we're paying into this and it would be more of a benefit of the Postal Service in the short run if we did. And your, your, your costs are higher than other federal employees, about 10 percent higher. No, they're, they're about the same, but we're the only ones that have that pre-funding mechanism. See. Now, just as a, uh, a, a informal survey that I conducted uh, among Postal Service employees, uh, they indicate to me that they would prefer to have uh, um, the, the day that you eliminate for service would be Saturday and not Monday. Just right. to share that. I like you. my weekends off, too. All right. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Parr, because of the interest in, in all of the issues here, we're going to ask you to stay for one more round of questioning. Uh, and let me begin that by, by asking you, uh, you know, we're hearing your plan, uh, which is, you know, we're going to slash service possibly from six to five days at a, at a significant burden to the, the customer. We're going to close post offices. We've already closed six uh, administrative facilities. We're going to get rid of 150,000 employees. And then after all that, you're projecting we're going to lose $6 billion. If that, if that is the future here, if that is the future next year, do you think you deserve a bonus for, for, for that performance? My, my incentive is, is based on performance parameters that are agreed to with the Board of Governors at the beginning of a year. Based on where I stand year to date, in terms of our financial position, I would not get a, a, a performance bonus this year or incentive uh, payment this year. Okay. And I'm working very hard because I would just like to mention that uh, all of our administrative employees, our managers, our supervisors, are tied into a national performance assessment program. Uh, their pay, whether they get a raise or whether they get any kind of a, an incentive pay in any year, is tied to the bottom line of the Postal Service. So, I mean, I don't want to be cavalier about this. It's extremely important that we work hard to, to do well so that 
not just not that I can earn a performance uh, incentive, but that those folks on the front line actually get a pay increase. I understand and I think that. that's a great motivating tool for our institution. Just wanted to be clear on that. Uh, HR 22. Uh, I mean, the fact that it's sponsored by Mr. Davis of Illinois and, and Mr. McHugh of New York, uh, two folks, two, two guys who I, I admire greatly and respect their opinion, I'm inclined to be receptive of that. But I also looked at numbers that, that said that if, if we do that, if we, if we pay the premiums out of the trust fund rather than putting $5 billion a year into the trust fund, that down the line, not very long, uh, 2017, we end up with $75 billion in unfunded liability uh, for, for health benefits for uh, my postal employees. I don't want to face that. Uh, so, you know, is, are we under the same impression that, that that's what's going to happen under this, under this uh, scenario? H.R. 22 will have us continue to pay 5.4 to $5.6 billion into the trust fund each of the next eight years. It relieves us of the, the burden of paying for retiree health benefits directly in each of those eight years. Mm. The money's come out of the trust fund. The trust fund will grow in each of those years. After that point in time, the, there will be a determination of, around what the requirements, the future requirements of the, of the fund are, and those costs will be amortized uh, I believe over a 40-year yeah. period of time. So uh, I believe that the mechanism that w is laid out in the current law and the proposal that's uh, put forth by HR 22 yeah. uh, has the double benefit of protecting our people as well as giving us right. short-term relief. Let me just say for the record, I'm not there yet. I'm open to it. I, you know, I've seen some numbers that concern me about what's going to happen to my postal employees in 2017, and I, you know, I don't want to be holding the bag to the tune of $75 billion for the health benefits, you know, stone cold, you know, in 2017, looking at that problem. I appreciate it's, the opportunity to come back and, and yeah, talk. Let's, let's do that. Talk let's, with let's, you about that. All right. The, the last thing is, uh, you know, I, I do have some familiarity with the Postal Service, and I, I, I recognize that in your last early retirement incentive, uh, it had no incentive. It was just an early, early out, voluntary early retirement. And you're looking to get rid of 150,000 people. Uh, that's not going to happen if you have the same plan you had last time. You almost added employees in your early, early retirement program uh, with, with no incentive. Is there going to be any incentive for, look at the economy. Look at the economy. You think people are going to go out the door when everything is so precarious. I'm just wondering, are you going to offer any type of incentive to any of these employees? I realize you've, you've got some employees who would not be eligible because of the importance of their positions, but it, will there be any attempt to offer any incentive to get people out the door? It's under consideration, but we have over 120,000 people who are currently el eligible to retire. We also have 150,000 who will be offered voluntary early retirement. When we say that we are going to reduce 150,000 people. It's 100, uh, the equivalent of 150,000 people. That includes overtime. Uh, we have employees, non-career employees, who we can let go. Today, as we speak, with 30,000 fewer career employees than we were this time last year, 10,000 non-career. So we have the flexibility to do that. We have a flexibility to uh, take our part-time flexible employees and only work them four hours every two weeks. Believe me, there's enough flexibility in our system to accomplish what, what you described. Uh, but that's not to say that every option isn't on the table and we wouldn't consider uh, bonuses, I mean, you know, incentives to go sometime in the future, but we don't need that today. Okay, I'm violating my own rule. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a few years ago, the President's Commission on the U.S. Postal Service made a number of recommendations. One of those recommendations was to a a Postal Network Optimization Commission, somewhat similar to a, a sort of a BRAC commission that was done on military bases. Uh, is this something you're supportive of, something you want to see done? Uh, why wasn't it done? Um, with 34,000 postal facilities, is this something we should be doing, and where is it on your list of priorities? The, the, the BRAC commission concept, uh, as I understood it back then, uh, was focused on our mail processing plant network. Um, and uh, it also probably could apply to our, our post office network. 
The thing that makes us a little different than the, the approach in the BRAC Commission is that uh, we have to serve every community in America. So we have to be in every location. Our plants have to be, you know, within a reasonable reach of each of our post offices. So there is, by its very nature, a network that exists, and it doesn't lend itself, in my opinion at the time, did not lend itself to some analysis at a national level. Um, and so, you know, in effect, you could have it at the state and local level with state and local politicians, uh, but uh, not necessarily something that, that really made sense to me at the time. So are, do you think we're at the optimal level now, or do you, do you so see? I, I think we're going to continue to evolve. I think the number of discussions that were talked about here today when it comes to, uh, you know, the future of delivery. Well, to me, delivery is tied to demand. Uh, and so if the demand today means that we go to every house five, you know, six days a week, fine, or if, if it's lower, it goes to five, at some point it might go to three. I do think we need to evolve. I think our plant network has evolved and will continue to evolve. Uh, and uh, we do and have been consolidating operations. I'm, I'm open to, if, you know, if it's a BRAC commission or some other group coming in, taking a look at the data so and making nothing, recommendations, you're, you're, you're we'd look doing, at them. You're not doing anything internally right now to look at so the consolidation or closing? We're constantly looking at that. Constantly looking at that. Constantly looking at that. We're constantly closing facilities. As I said earlier, we're consolidating, uh, moving mail from one facility to another facility where it makes sense. For example, um, less mail is put into mailboxes every day. So we have fewer facilities today that cancel mail and sort mail for the, the world than did, you know, 10 years ago. Okay. Let me, uh, time is short here. Uh, you mentioned with the 150,000 employees nationwide that uh, give them the opportunity to take early retirement, how many do you ex expect that would actually take advantage of that opportunity? Well, well, well I would expect that, that maybe in the neighborhood of 10 to 15,000. 10 to 15,000. But okay. you also have 120,000 people who are eligible to retire and who will retire over time. Are you suggesting, are you taking a firm commitment to say we're making a recommendation to move to five day service or are you just saying that's on the table at this point? What I'm saying is that, given what I know today, uh, that we have to make a structural change. The one that makes most sense to me is to give the Board of Governors the flexibility to move from six-day to five-day delivery. I think that they will exercise their judgment on, on whether or not we need to move to that in its entirety, whether we would do that. As I said at the Senate, I had proposed to do that during our light volume periods. Uh, and that's where this whole thing began. And one of the senators asked me, uh, does that mean that you're only asking for the summer period? I said, no. Uh, we want to have the flexibility given to the Board of Governors, people who are presidentially appointed, Senate approved, to make that change as necessary to assure the financial stability of the Postal Service. Do you believe that would be a permanent change? or? I think once made, it would be. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I won't take five minutes because I don't believe that you can actually get blood out of a turnip. Um, Am I a turnip? I think you can slice it, <laughs> you can dice it, you can puree it, you can saute it, you can squeeze it, you can tease it, and you still end up with turnip juice. But, but, but. We were about to explore just for a moment your optimism relative to the ability to grow volume. And I was saying that it was difficult for me to see any room, uh, any possibility. Could, could you? Well, let me just say that the Postal Service is in a number of markets. So one of, one of the products that we have is an advertising product. When I say grow, I'm talking about growing from where we are today. Uh, if 20% of advertising mail went away, which it has, and by the way, it's reflective of what's going on in the marketplace for advertising. Uh, if people now want to make investments in advertising, I think that mail is going to be a channel that they're going to consider. Prior to this downturn in the economy, our market share of advertising dollars total 
advertising dollars that were spent on mail had been growing. There's why? Because people were looking to have the ability to target different customers, and they wanted measurability, and mail is very measurable. And so my belief is that as the economy comes back, advertising mail will grow again. Will it get back to the levels it was before the economy went down? I hope so. But I know it's going to grow beyond where it is today. Likewise, packages. Our package business is down. When I do a comparison of where we are versus the competition and look at what's the impact of the downturn in the economy on their revenues, we're very comparable. I don't think there's anyone in this room who doesn't think that as the economy comes back, our competition's packages and their volume won't grow. So I have faith that our market share will be maintained as volume grows. The one area that, Congressman, where we have a real problem is first class mail. It's transactional in nature. It's bill presentment, bill payment. Once someone goes online and begins to pay bills online, they're not going to come back to the Postal Service because you know, of the very nature of, of, you know, once you have that happen, you're not going to do it. So when I talk about growth, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those categories of mail where we have a natural strength in the marketplace. And I believe that we will, we will bounce back in those areas. Even first class mail, we were declining in first class mail about three to five percent per year in terms of volume. Well, we're down over 10 percent. And I believe that the difference between three and five and 10 is largely driven by the economy. When the economy comes back, we may see an uptick in first-class mail. And so that, that's what I'm talking about, growth. Uh, and I'm talking about competing in certain sectors and growing our market share. Well, let me thank you very much, because I, like Chairman Lynch, don't want to be left holding the bag in 2017, even if it's a mail bag. So I hope that we are indeed able to make these ideas work. And I thank you very much, Mr. Potter, for your testimony. I thank the gentleman. The chairman recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, I'm just listening to you, and I'm trying to make sure I'm making heads or tails of this. Let's go to your salary. I'm not going to beat you up on your salary. You don't have to worry about that. But the 66, you're telling me that $66,000 of your, of what they say is your, is your compensation. compensation, you don't pay tax, it's security. Is yeah. that right? Yes. Where are they securing you from? I mean, they, I mean, I mean, are you? They worry about you. Who is that mandated? Well, I can tell you when it started. <laughs> I can tell you when it started. It started. It started when we were uh, uh, after uh, we came under attack from anthrax. Uh huh. Okay. And I was somewhere, and my chief inspector got a call from someone. Uh, and I think it might have been the Secret gotcha. Service. But you don't, you don't, you, certainly you don't pay taxes on that. No. Okay. No. But, and, but it's considered for some reason compensation, you know. And, and give me the other one, the other pieces of it, of the compensation. The, well, the other piece is the salary. And then the other piece is I'm a 31 year postal employee. And, okay, you went through And my that three formula. year high is going up because I got a salary increase. And so, that's, that's, that's almost half of the money they're talking about because they're projecting. You know, my age, I'll live to 80-something, and here's how much money you'll get over those years. Mm, okay. Let me, let me go back to this. The, you know, when we look at uh, all the methods of communicating today uh, over the Internet and what have you, um, clearly, and, and you've testified to this, that that cut some of your, a substantial amount of your business. Are we using, Mr. Potter, um, are we taking full advantage of our advances in technology and uh, with, with, within the postal system? Are there things that we could do to cut our costs further? And that's number one. And number two, when we look at the, the whole idea of this Saturday service, and I, I can tell you, um, I would bet everything I've got that that's not going to happen. Um, just cutting the Saturday service, so you you might want to take that off the table. Um, but let me let me ask you this: Have we figured out which part of that is? I mean, how do you how do you figure figure out your savings? In other words, is most of your savings from people actually going 
our delivery people delivering the mail, and and I'm just, I'm thinking if the volume is still the same, I'm trying to figure out, you know, while they may be delivering Monday through Friday, if the volume is still the same, I'm just there's certain manpower that goes into preparing the mail to be delivered, and I'm just trying to figure out how do you make that divide and and what percentage? Are you, are you following my question? I, I understand exactly what okay. you're saying. So. Uh, Today, over 90% of the mail that a carrier brings down the street, letter mail, is sorted by a machine into walk sequence. So they don't come into the office anymore and case every letter. And so there's, we're down to the point where less than two hours of a carrier's day is spent in the office preparing mail to go out on the street. So that's the letter side. We're automating the flat side. That's coming next. And so when you look at the savings associated with, with not delivering mail on any day of the week, it's having over 200,000 people leave an office and go out on the street driving to, to the delivery and then you know, spending the day on their route. We do recognize that some sorting that would have gone on the morning of the day that we eliminate will have to move to the next day. So we account for the fact that that occurs. We also account for the fact in our cost savings that rural carriers on the sixth day, the rural routes, excuse me, are covered by rural carrier relief folks who make less money than our career people. And so we recognize that the career people are the only ones working five days a week. Uh, now, part of what drives us is what does the American public think? And there have been a number of surveys of, of the American public. And when it comes to the future and mail, uh, really we should be responding to the American public. And what they're saying by the Rasmussen poll and a Gallup poll is that they'd much prefer to have you know, lesser frequency of delivery than they would have uh, pay additional postage, uh, you know, pay, for, you know, pay for the fact that our costs are going up because we're so labor intensive. And ultimately, that's who I think you know, we have to respond to. Um, and so, believe me, it's <laughs> I don't take that step lightly at all. Uh, uh, you know, uh, again, I grew up in a postal family, and uh, you know, I'm not popular these days because I'm out there talking about it. But if the choice is mail delivery in the future uh, or no mail delivery, I think you have to say let's make the changes so we can assure that we reach every home in America. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, this time has expired. The chair now recognizes the general lady from District of Columbia, Miss Miss Eleanor Holmes Norton. Uh, Mr. Potter, I am particularly interested in the health care costs, and, and I note uh, again that uh, you've proposed that that over an eight-year period, uh, the statutory mandate that we imposed a few years back to prefund uh, annuitants health care uh, should be relieved. Now, the GAO says that it would prefer two years but that either option, neither option, may do much for uh, the Postal Service. Um, in what way do you think this would fix the problem, the overall problem of the Postal Service? And if not pre-funded, how would you make up for uh, the, 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 fu the funding of the annuance? Well, well, let me clarify again. Right now, this year we're required to pay $7.4 billion into for retiree health benefits. That's well over 10 percent of the revenues that we take in. Uh, and so the relief that we're seeking is the $2 billion. We'll continue to pay, according to, as proposed by HR 22, we'll continue to pay into the trust fund $5.4 to $5.6 billion a year for eight years. That's more money going into the trust fund than would come out to pay for the $2 billion So you don't, you don't think it would have any effects then? No, I, I think the, the effect would be that the, the obligation for the Postal Service in future years beyond 2016 will be greater for, to contribute to retiree health benefits than it is today. But I would say that we are paying too much today, that we're not paying a fair share, that we're paying much too much. Uh, and yeah. so I think this, what's well, offered uh, the is... The GAO says two years so that we can rethink this notion. This goes back to my business model question. Uh, do you think that we all need to sit down and think the entire model before jumping to uh, one big uh, uh, cut like that? One big change, I'm sorry, like that? Well, uh, personally, I believe that, that H.R. 22 uh, has the short-term benefit of, of getting us through the year and enabling us to pay our bills. Mm -hmm. 
and it helps us in, in subsequent years to do that. I do think that you're on a parallel path, though, that we need that as well as the, the discussion that you just described about, mm -hmm. you know, we need to look at all of our options, we need to come up with a, a plan, and we need to execute it. Again, I think in, in timing, the timing of when we execute it is based on the anticipated demand for postal services. So, and I know uh, we can't, you can't predict the future, and incremental death is a pretty terrible death. So, again, I'm looking for a way to, to, to deal with the problem that is to say uh, short term, yes, uh, but then to look, look, look at its consequences. And I hear what you're saying and understand okay. it. Uh, uh, how green is the Postal Service? Um, you do a lot of, perhaps as much as uh, anyone in the country, of traveling by motor. Um, would you tell us how you are conserving, if you are conserving fuel, and how you are conserving it? Well, first, when it comes to fuel, right-hand drive, I mean, we, we've changed our delivery routes to make sure that we have as many right-hand turns in there as possible. Uh, how often do you buy new vehicles? Uh, well, we haven't bought vehicles in some 17 years. You haven't what? We haven't bought, we have a fleet. Our fleet of vehicles is some 17 years old. We are very anxious to take that fleet, modernize that fleet. And so if one goes down, it's just a down and, and, you, and, and you don't replace it? No, we have aluminum body vehicles. We have added some vans to that fleet as, as deliveries have grown. But we bought a special what fuel, vehicle. What fuel are those that, that? Right now they're gasoline. Why? Well, well because of, of the fact that uh, well, there's a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that uh, up until last year, we were limited in terms of alternate fuel vehicles that we could consider, could consider. hybrids and the like. We were not given credit for in, in the, uh, uh, you know, from the federal government. We have that law has now since been changed. So I think we're not giving credit that. for. Uh, what do you mean by not giving credit for? Uh, well, there were, we were required to have a certain percentage of our fleet be alternate fuel vehicles. The definition of what an alternate fuel vehicle was very narrow. We work with the Department of Energy and with the folks up here on the Hill and Congressman Davis and others to get that definition expanded so that we could consider other types of, of vehicles. Right now we are testing, as we speak, hydrogen fuel vehicles, gas-powered fuel vehicles, you know, uh, uh, pro, uh, natural gas vehicles. We're testing a number of different alternatives. Mr. Chairman, could I ask you if, if you would allow this witness to submit to you an inventory of the complement of vehicles they have now based on precisely what form of fuel uh, they use so we can get a sense of that? I'd also be proud to submit with that, uh, Congresswoman, all of our activities in terms of going green because we have a very good racket and okay. I'd, I'd like to do it justice by submitting that as well. Thank you very much. I think, Thank we, you, could, Mr. Chairman. I think we could work that out. I know that uh, you did present a, a vehicle uh, count inventory, but I don't think it was broken down as, as uh, Ms. Norton would like. So perhaps you could just look through that and get the information to the committee we'll uh, to as soon that. as possible. Okay, Mr. Potter, I have no further questions. I want to thank you for your attendance here, and I wish you a good day. Thank you. Uh, as you probably heard, we have some votes currently on the floor. I understand there are at least three in this series, which probably means we will not be back for about, at, at a minimum, a half hour, probably a little bit longer. So uh, everybody's welcome to stretch your legs, and we'll be back, like I say, in about 30 to 40 minutes.